Today we are looking at a case from the late 19th century. So sit back as we go to Spain. Juan Diez de Garayo was born on October the 17th, 1821, in the small Spanish village of Eguilas, near the town of Salvatierra in northern Spain. He was the ninth child, born to his parents, Nicholas and Norbetta, who were poor farmers with no education, and the whole family was illiterate. Like his brothers and sisters before him, when he was very young, Juan's parents sent him to work in the service of wealthy families who lived in the nearby towns. His parents had very little option other than to send their children to work, as during the early 19th century, Spain was going through a period of economic hardship. Between 1810 and 1821, the country was engaged in the Mexican War of Independence, and by the 1820s, they had lost much of their control in the Americas. This was followed in 1833 by the First Carlist War, fought between two factions over the succession of the Spanish throne and the nature of the monarchy. Families such as the Garayos often felt forgotten during these problematic times. Juan eventually settled in the services of a blacksmith. He seemed to thrive there. He worked hard and was good with the horses. However, after seven years, he moved on to work on a small farm owned by a widow named Antonia Beros de Guieta. He was very respectful to his new employer, working long hours and helped make the farm a success. But working every day with the widow Antonia eventually led to them getting closer and somewhat inevitably, they got married. The marriage was a happy one and together they continued to work on the farm. They had five children, three of who survived. But just as everything seemed to be going so well for Juan, Tragedy struck in 1863, when after 13 years of marriage, his wife Antonia died. This was not only a sorrowful time for the grieving widower, it also caused him domestic and economic problems. He had to tend his farm, control the finances, educate his children and run the house. He had aspirations for his children to get some sort of education and unlike him, be able to read and write. Juan decided that the best thing to do would be to find another wife. So to try and restore some order into his household, he married a lady named Juana Salazar. She was a very disciplined woman who set very strict rules. And as time went by, she became loathed by her stepchildren. The marriage was supposed to bring harmony to the house, but instead it brought conflict. After seven years of marriage, Juana contracted smallpox and died in 1870. Juan had always been a hard-working, peaceful man, but his second marriage had somehow changed him. He had become sullen and withdrawn. By now he was nearly 50 years old and lonely, and he wondered if he should marry again. On Saturday the 2nd of April 1870, just a few weeks after his wife had died, Juan met a woman in the city of Vitoria. She was known locally as La Val de Goviesa and had started to make money as a prostitute as her husband had recently died. Together they walked to the outskirts of the city where there was a small stream. The area was well known to the lady. Once their business was concluded, Juan offered her three pesetas, but the lady said it was too little. He offered her four, but she said no. Strangely, instead of paying, he strangled her and as she lost consciousness, he drowned her in the stream. He placed her body on the bank and calmly returned to the city. The next day she was found by a young servant girl who was collecting flowers. The authorities were called and the victim was identified. But the case was not really investigated and closed shortly afterwards due to lack of any evidence. A few months later, Juan got married for a third time. But again his choice of wife brought him even more misery and his marriage was plagued by conflict. He soon discovered that his wife was an alcoholic, but Juan was not a very good husband. He paid his wife little attention, and instead of spending time with her, he preferred to go drinking in Vitoria. On March the 12th, 1871, Juan was seen having a conversation at the city gates with a poor middle-aged widow. She was humbly dressed and survived by doing various odd jobs and by the charity of others. 
He suggested that they went out for a stroll in the country, but the lady said that she had not had anything to eat all day, so he kindly gave her some change, so she could buy some wine and some bread. They agreed to meet at the Navarra Road at dusk. Juan waited patiently until the lady arrived, and together they walked down the hill to the stream. They were now very close to the place where he had been nearly a year earlier, where the first crime took place. He offered to pay for sex, but the lady didn't agree with the price, and they started to argue. The next day, the body of the lady was found on the bank by the stream. She had been strangled and drowned. The police were informed and noted that the crime had been committed only 400 metres away from a virtually identical crime a year earlier. However, the detective work uncovered no leads, and once again, they closed the inquiry. Locals had their own theories to who the killer was. They surmised that it was probably a wandering traveller who roamed from city to city, committing his atrocities. But the police believed the culprit was someone well-educated, who possessed a high level of intelligence, as he left no trace or evidence when he committed his crimes. For the next 17 months, things were peaceful around Vittoria, until on August the 22nd, 1872, when a man working on the road found the body of a girl in a ditch. She had been strangled. The police investigation found that the girl had been sent on an errand by her masters the previous day, but hadn't returned. Great fear suddenly entered the homes of the residents of the city, and the authorities ordered that the police double their efforts to catch the killer. But again, with no leads in the case, they had nothing to go on. Seven days later, on the 29th of August, 1872, the body of a 23-year-old woman named Maria Cristina was found. She had also been strangled near the bridge and close to the stream. However, this time, the victim had also been stabbed with her own hairpin. By now, the authorities had become desperate to catch the killer. People had become afraid, and the female residents of the city no longer liked to venture past the city walls and never wanted to go out alone. The crimes in Vitoria were now being reported throughout Spain. The press called the unknown killer El Sacamantecas, the large man, and rekindled the story first associated with Manuel Blanco Roma Santa, who in the first half of the 19th century would extract the fat of his victims and make soap and lubricants, which he would sell from door to door. Juan did not do this, but the Spanish press wanted to sensationalize the story, and mothers started to repeat it to their children. They wanted to put fear into their daughters, and make sure that they didn't go out. A year passed, and the unsolved crime seemed to be a distant memory. Again, everybody went about their business as normal, until in August 1873, when a prostitute went to the stream at dusk with a man. They started to argue, and the man started to attack her. She screamed, and fortunately two soldiers who had been sitting out of sight further down the bank rushed to her aid. As they got closer, the man ran off. Ten months later, in June 1874, an old woman was attacked by a man just outside the city walls. She screamed, and when two other women arrived, the attacker ran away. The old woman claimed that her attacker was Juan Garayo and said that he was drunk and had attempted to kill her. But for some reason, she did not inform the police and no action was taken. On the night of the 3rd of April, 1876, Juan's previously healthy wife suddenly died, and he again found himself a widower. He did not grieve for her, as they had become very distant, and their relationship was never a happy one. A month later, however, he married his fourth wife, a widow named Juana Ibisate. Again, the marriage was not particularly happy. They constantly argued, and Juan would drink too much. He would frequently go to the city and not return until the next day. On the 1st of November, 1878, when Juan was passing a mill in the suburbs of Vitoria, he saw a woman named Ankara Amentia. Noticing that there was no one else around, he tried to strangle her. However, the woman managed to escape and ran to alert the authorities. Juan was arrested and taken into custody. He was then put in front of a magistrate 
who sentenced him to two months in prison for the attack. The police failed to make any connection with the four previous murders, and after 60 days, Juan Garayo was released. He returned to working in the fields, but 10 months later, on August the 25th, 1879, he was traveling on the road from Vittoria to Castile. The road was quiet when he stumbled upon a poor woman. He tried to talk to her, but she was wary of the strange man. She hadn't forgotten the terrible crimes that had been happening around the city. Suddenly he pushed her to the side of the road and into a ditch. A struggle followed, and even though the woman hurt her head, she managed to kick her attacker and run back to Vittoria screaming. Juan followed her into the city and asked his wife to help him. Together they managed to bribe the woman into not denouncing him to the police. Juan then cautiously left the city. He attempted to return on the 7th of September, but while walking on the road in the outskirts of Vittoria, he saw a pretty 25-year-old maid named Maria Dolores Cortazar. Suddenly, he pushed the young woman off the road and asked her if he could pay her for sex. But Maria was a respectable young woman who worked in domestic service and told him that she was not a prostitute. Juan would not take no for an answer and attack the poor defenceless maid. He killed her by inflicting severe cuts on her stomach. He then calmly hid her body and her belongings. He decided that it would probably be prudent not to continue his journey into Vittoria. So instead he took a detour through the mountains, spending a night under a bridge close to a river. The next day he ate breakfast in an inn in Ariaga, but instead of going to the city, he went back to the bridge and climbed the hill of Araka. Here he came across a poor 52-year-old peasant woman who was returning from the festival in Vittoria with some food that she had purchased. They had a pleasant conversation, but it started to rain, so they sought shelter under a tree. Quan then asked the woman if she was a prostitute. Suddenly she felt scared. Who was this strange man? She ran off, but Wan caught up with her and proceeded to strangle the poor lady. She became unconscious. He then stabbed her in the heart and the belly with the same razor and knife that he had used the previous day. He cleaned the blood on his hands with the victim's clothing ate the food in her baskets and went to sleep under the bridge. In the morning, he threw the razor and knife in the river before making his way back to the city. Later that day, the bodies of the two women were found. As news of the two dead women circulated the city, the authorities knew they had to find the person responsible. The previous investigations had led them nowhere, but the whole of Spain was now reading about the crimes of El Sacramentecas. The investigation was led by Jose Antonio de Parada. Witnesses came forward who had spoken to a man near to where the last murders had taken place. One was a farmer who described a man who had spoken to him while he was tending his cows. Another was a postal worker who had seen a man and a woman talking on September the 7th, close to where the body of the young domestic servant was found. Both witnesses described a very similar looking man. Police also spoke to the owner of the inn in Ariaga, who confirmed that the man they described ate breakfast there on the 8th of September, but the police still did not know who they were looking for. No name, just a description from three witnesses. Suddenly a young policeman remembered the man who had served two months in prison for the 1878 attack on Ankara Amrindia and it was apparent that there was a striking similarity. An arrest order was made, and the police went to the home of Juan Garayo. However, he was not there, and his wife said that she had not seen him for two weeks, and had no idea where he was. He was, in fact, working on a farm in the village of Alegria. On the 21st of September, Juan returned to Vittoria. Although he tried to enter the city in an inconspicuous manner, he was recognised and the police arrested him and escorted him to the police station. He was interrogated, but he denied all the charges made against him. Nevertheless, the police kept him in jail and he was constantly questioned. After 12 days, he broke down and confessed to six murders and four attempted murders. On the 3rd of October, he repeated this confession in front of a judge. Sentencing took place on the 11th of November and Juan Garayo was sentenced to death. 
His defence lawyers appealed for conviction, arguing that Juan was in fact insane. The judge ordered that a well-known doctor named Ramon Apraiz, along with 11 colleagues, examine the accused and determine his mental state. They produced a report on March 3, 1881, which concluded that the defendant was not insane and was perfectly aware of what he was doing. The defence asked for a second report. This time the evaluation was conducted by doctors from Madrid and Toledo. They reported that in their opinion, Juan had committed the crimes under the influence of partial madness. However, the Supreme Court rejected these findings and agreed with the initial reports, so the original sentence was upheld. On the 11th of May, 1881, Juan Díaz de Garayo was garroted in the courtyard of the Polverín Viejo prison in Vitoria. His body was then publicly displayed for 10 hours before he was buried in an unmarked grave in the Santa Isabel Cemetery. In Spain, the tale of El Sacramentecas has lasted for over two centuries and is still told to misbehaving children to this day. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. Please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I will see you in the next brief case.